I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for today, who is Dylan Ray. Dylan Ray is involved in a, a teacher development norm profit in South Africa with a focus specifically on supporting history teachers. He will be introducing himself as well during the presentation. So Dylan, take it away. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, so it's wonderful to be here. I really thank you for the invitation. Um, I, I, I didn't check, Alice, are, are, there, are there people who are not history teachers? I mean, are there other teachers besides history teachers in this room and network? It's mostly history teachers, okay. but there's okay. uh, history educators more at large as well, and a little bit of okay. citizenship. It okay, never lovely. Hurts. So we'll go for, um, uh, the point is we don't have maths and science teachers, which is great. No, um, I, I, it's really <laughs> wonderful to be in a room full of, even if it's a virtual room full of history teachers, I'm an ex-history teacher. Um, um, if you are, if you happen to not be a history teacher, but you're in the, on this call, that's fantastic because you at least agree that history is an important force in the world. Um, and I think for for so many of the problems we face, um, history does provide some solution and some window into some hope, um, and I think uh, a window into sometimes what we can do better. Um, and so it, it, it's always incredible, you know, to, to be with history teachers. Um, the work that I do in South Africa is largely centered around a program called Facing History and Ourselves. Uh, you can Google Facing History and Ourselves. I think some of you probably know Facing History. Um, uh, we've had a partnership with that American organization for over 20 years now. Um, and we use a lot of their programs and methodologies adapted in South Africa. We develop our own as well, but everything is centered around really the history teacher in a classroom and the 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 young people that she or he engages with. Um, and so, um, I, you know, in, in today's talk, um, I'll be drawing on some of that of that work and that knowledge of that I get from facing history and that work um, but also I you know I think it's um, this this topic of fake news propaganda it I think it's so central to to our understanding of ourselves as history teachers and and I think importantly our role as as history teachers and I, and I, 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 I do hope that that in the, the, the little bit of input that I give and the conversation we have afterwards that we leave here feeling that actually as, as history teachers, you know, this is on us. Uh, we, we've, got a lot to, we've got a lot to do to ensure that, our young, that the young people in our classrooms, when they leave, that they are, they're engaging very differently with the information around them. Um, and if they leave our classrooms and they're not, then, you know, maybe we, we need to do, do things a bit more differently. So, um, because we're a room full of history teachers, it makes sense that the first thing you see is something historical. Um, and of course, it would be great if my PowerPoint worked. There we go. Um, oh, so um, a little, a very brief uh, history lesson. Um, we're history teachers. It makes sense to have an historical, a historical source as a, as a start. Um, but I, I, something that maybe some of you know, some of you don't know, 1930s, late 1930s, um, an, institute, an institute was founded called the Institute for Propaganda Analysis, um, set up in, in New York. Um, and really, they set up this short-lived institute, um, mind you. Um, many things happened post-1937, which really, I guess, sidetracked them <laughs> like a war. Um, but post, um, you know, around late 1930s, they set up this institute really with this, the, the intention of, say, of, of helping kind of arm um, citizens, although in their language they were they were really wanting to arm just the intelligent citizens, but nevertheless, um, they wanted to arm citizens with with the kind of tools to engage with propaganda, um, and they they came up with with I suppose seven uh, principle or seven um, aspects of propaganda so they can help people recognize these things and we'll, we'll go into into these those those seven in, in a short while but but just as a, a reminder one of the, one of the reasons that they had had really uh, decided that they needed to 
really educate people around propaganda was because of the propaganda that they had faced and had disseminated and um, absorbed uh, in World War I. Um, they were an American organization, so of course their lens was about the, 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 the negative propaganda that they would, have, they would have felt, but they also realized that the propaganda that they were putting out to their population um, uh, in order to get them to enlist, in order to get them to continue the fighting, was successful and it was powerful. And they really felt that that could also be used um, in, a, in a dangerous way. So, so they really wanted to, that was their kind of, their kind of motivation. But of course, this idea of, of, of um, institutions, whether they be governments or um, newspapers uh, or, um, or other kind of early media, that wasn't new um, in, in the world. I mean, back in 1835, uh, the Sun newspaper um, uh, on their front page produced that picture and a series of other pictures, essentially saying they discovered life on the moon. Um, and they did that. And for for a few a few at least a few of their um, their their articles and their kind of uh, daily newspapers, people really believed that life had been discovered on the moon, and it looked like that. Um, they did it not for any political purposes, but to boost their readership. And their readership they did boost. Um, and so even in 1835, people were realizing we can influence people with fantastic stories with interesting imagery. Um, uh, another example, 1916, before you know, the propaganda in, in the war had really kind of taken root. Um, in Chicago, there was, a, well, there was a, a boycott in Chicago around eggs, uh, eggs because egg prices had shot up. Um, uh, obviously, war would, or pending war would do that. Um, and prices had shut up, and so a boycott was organized, largely by housewives, uh, to not buy eggs. Um, and then the boycott was going really, really well, and almost looked like they'd succeeded. And on, I forget the day, but on a particular day, the newspaper headlines were, um, egg prices are dropping, um, you know, this has been successful. Um, the, the, it was fake news. Um, the newspaper was in kind of cahoots with the egg industry. Um, but because they had, had, had put out that the egg prices are dropping, people believed it, the boycott ended, and they kind of disarmed the, uh, the women who were boycotting. Um, yeah, boycotting. So, so this idea of, of propaganda and fake news was, was not new, um, but it was something that this Institute of Propaganda Studies um, or Propaganda Analysis, what they, what, they really felt that we need to be I mean, the citizens. So they came up with these seven uh, principles. I'm not going to look all of them, but here's, here's one of them. I, I uh, excuse the blurriness. I will just read uh, parts of it. So, so one aspect or identify, identifier of propaganda is this idea what they call name calling. And they said it's a device to make us form a judgment without examining the evidence on which it should be based. Here, the propagandist appeals to our hate and our fear. He, of course, at that time, it would always be a he. But, you know, there we go. He does this by giving bad names to those individuals, groups, nations, races, policies, practices, beliefs, ideals, for which he would have us condemn and reject. So basically, that's one aspect that prop one tool of propaganda, call them bad names, make them uh, look evil and be evil. That's the one tool. The other one is, I guess, on the, on the opposite side, uh, while you are calling uh, some people bad names, you are calling some people, i.e. yourselves or your cause, virtuous and good names. So this is the glittering generalities, as they uh, referred to it. So a device by which the propagandist identifies his program with virtue by the use of virtue words. Here he appeals to our emotions of love, generosity, and brotherhood. Um, he uses words like truth, freedom, honor, liberty, social justice, uh, constitution defender. These words suggest shining ideals. All persons of goodwill believe in these ideals. Hence the propagandist, by identifying his individual group or nation with or race or policy with these ideals, seeks to win us to his clause. So on the one hand, it's, it's name calling, bad names to bad people or bad causes you don't want people to support. The other one is um, glittering generality, generalities about yourselves or your cause. And then the final, well, there were, there were seven, but the final one I'm going to look at is this idea of called card stacking. And so card stacking is 
is what the, the propagandist employs all the arts of deception to win our support for himself, his group, nation, race, policy, practice, beliefs, or ideals. He stacks the cards against the truth. He uses underemphasis and overemphasis to dodge issues and evade facts. He retorts to lies, censorship. He omits facts. He offers false testimony. He creates a smokescreen of clamor. He draws a red herring across the trail to confuse and divert those in quest of facts he does not want to be revealed. He makes the unreal appear real and the real appear unreal. He lets half-truth masquerade as truth. Sounds very familiar to this fake news world that we are in. Um, only, of course, uh, on steroids now because of, of social media and technology. So, so this was uh, these ideas of, 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 and the tools of propagandists had, of course, we know had been around. They'd been identified by some as could be dangerous. We need to be arming ourselves. And in fact, they turned, they turned these, uh, these seven principles into little flashcards that, that uh, uh, people could put in their wallets and walk around in their pockets. So if they were encountered by propaganda, they could pull out their card, identify which card is they're being faced with, whether it was card stacking or truth or name calling or glittering something, um, and that would help them uh, disarm. So, so they were trying to put something very practical in. It, it didn't last too long, and then war broke out. Um, and then by the time World War II had ended, propaganda was just so much and advertising was so um, deeply embedded anyway. But, but the point is with, with, with me, I wanted to introduce this, is that there, are these, there were these principles that were emerging that, that's, that sound very familiar to what we're facing uh, today in, in this kind of world where we are, where, we are, where, where I suppose we, we, we are used to in some way propaganda, we are becoming more used to and finding ways that we need to engage with this idea of fake news. And that really, as I said in the, in the title of this thing, that there's a thin line, possibly a blurred line today between what is propaganda and, and what is fake news. So I, 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 let me also say that um, you're all intelligent people. You, you can also, you can, you know, go to Wikipedia and Google the definitions of propaganda and fake news. And as you'll see, you'll find a number of definitions um, of propaganda and fake news. Um, so I'm just pulling out just one thing just to kind of uh, put us on the, on the same page. But if we, if we were to start by, by saying that really if we, at it, maybe it's at, at its simplest form um, uh, or one of its most simplest forms, that propaganda really is the selective use of information and largely for political effect. We know the tools of propaganda are so the same tools that advertisers will use and marketers, but, but really propaganda largely is a political motivation. Um, fake news, and we'll come to this, this you know, I, I'm, not even, I'm not even too sure if this is the right def definition. As, you, as you'll see, I, I probably um, uh, go back on, on, on myself in, in, a, in, a, in a few slides time. But, but really, I suppose we would look at them as fake news as being largely news stories um, that, are, that are false, they fabricated, generally have no verifiable facts um, or limited um, or no verifiable viable sources. Um, and, and of course, you can imagine that these things are kind of linked. So an example, if we go back in time to uh, World War II, um, in, in order for... I guess the propaganda, uh, the British propaganda uh, machine, in order for them to kind of, uh, I guess, take away some of Hitler's power, they produced, they reproduced German stamps and distributed them. Um, but instead of Hitler's face, they put Himmler's face so that Hitler and Hitler's supporters would feel that, oh, oh maybe Himmler is trying to take over and maybe he's really trying to, you know, oust Hitler. Um, and so, so that in some ways, of course, it's propaganda. Um, but it's also fake news. It's also creating something that did not exist, um, that, that, that um, has a very particular message that is made up and in that case was a lie. Himmler wasn't about to replace, replace Hitler. The Germans did the same thing to the British um, a little bit later on. Uh, they used the, the, the uh, King George 
the fifth, I think, if my, my British history is a little shocking, but I think it was King George the fifth, definitely a King George, definitely a king, a British king. Um, for his coronation, um, they used the same stamps for the coronation, but instead of they just replaced the queen with a um, picture of Joseph Stalin to show this um, alliance between um, uh, communism and and Russia and and Britain. Um, you'll also notice if you if you you know got really close to your screen that the above Stalin's head is a um, uh, a star of David. So there was also an implication that this alliance is uh, anti you know well it was anti-Semitic for sure the cards were but that the alliance is in some way grounded by um, a, a master Jewish plan to take over the world, which obviously fitted the, the narrative. Again, it is propaganda, but it's also fake news. These stamps did not exist. Um, they've recreated the stamp to make it look like um, like something else that has a particular message. So, so even though we have propaganda, which is a political purpose, we have fake news, sometimes these, these two things really can become blurred and, and merged. And I think that's an important thing for for young people especially to to be seen that propaganda isn't just necessarily um okay will, will not use fake news or fake news is not a part of propaganda of course um, as we've seen with many countries around the world um one very big one in particular uh, related to stalin but let's not name any anyone um uh, that even there um this this blurring of fake news and propaganda is becoming a very powerful tool and i think really um, instead of getting perhaps caught up too much in, in a, a very um, hard line between propaganda, what is propaganda and what is fake news, I think where, where possibly I would say we should be putting some attention is between this idea of disinformation and misinformation. Um, because I think, you know, if we just, again, many definitions of these things, I'm just picking this because it was it's easy. But if, this, if we looked at this disinformation really, this kind of deliberately f sharing of false information in order to deceive or cause harm. So there's an intentionality about it, um, and it really is to deceive or cause harm, which is different to misinformation, which is, again, it's false or misleading information, but it's not necessarily uh, put out in order to cause harm or of particular purpose of a, a political motive. So if we go back to to one of the in the, the more modern uh, time of 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 this emergence of fake news. Um, it I, I, apologies. I think in my in my power shortages, my brain went as well. But I believe it was around 2017 or 16 um, when fake news appeared about Hillary Clinton. Um, a whole bunch of different um, accusations and news stories about her, from being uh, you know the mother of of aliens to uh, various uh, sexual things and a whole bunch of stuff. But these news articles appeared in, in what looked like news sites. Well, it was tracked down once they tracked down who created these things. It was created by some Lithuanian uh, young IT specialists who, who created these news articles about Hillary Clinton, not because they wanted Donald Trump to win. So it wasn't a political motive in order to, which would maybe be slightly propagandist. So it wasn't disinformation to really intentionally cause harm. It was more, it was, it was probably maybe more misinformation because their, their aim was to get clickbait, to get likes and hits on their websites. And so they said, well, where in the world are people's, is people's attention? Oh, it's Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. So let's create stuff about Hillary Clinton because that's going to get all the Donald Trump people to really click on that stuff. We're going to make a lot of money. And that was their intention. Of course, Donald Trump and others were able to use that as disinformation in their own way as well. Um, so, so even this, this kind of the, the roots of, of, of modern, I suppose, or more recent fake news, um, you know, even that came out of less a political motive and more a, um, a, a, a selling motive. Um, but I think it is important because this, this distinction though between disinformation and misinformation, because the, the tools to counter that are quite different. If we, because those who are using disinformation, those who are, who are uh, creating, you know, using bots on Facebook and creating, uh, using the, the Facebook advertising machine, or have used it, they put a lot of money 
and power and resources behind those particular messages. Um, and so therefore to counter it, um, one, if it would beyond being teachers as society, we need to put a similar kind of effort to counter it. But we also need to realize that that, that I suppose that enemy of disinformation is very powerful and very strong. The misinformation, the, history is littered with misinformation. The press is littered with misinformation of mistakes. People not checking their facts and their sources. Why don't you get a story out quickly? Um, misinformation happens when it comes to my cell phone from my mother and she tells me some crazy thing about Martians. Oh, I shouldn't insult my mother. Uh, someone sends me something crazy about Martians and I automatically forward it on without actually checking. That's misinformation. I'm not deliberately wanting to bring down the world, but I'm also not doing my um, duty. So so I think there's 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 an important space in classrooms and especially with history teachers for us for us to look at at this difference between disinformation and and misinformation because it's i think when we go back to propaganda and fake news it's that it's that disinformation that is the 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 i guess lies between both propaganda and fake news and 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 it's the danger of propaganda the danger effect of fake news lies in where disinformation, um, disinformation lies. But I wanted to add something else too about, about this term fake news. Um, and I think again, this is not an answer. This is not, um, it's something I'm, I'm not necessarily um, even um, yet totally convinced of, but I think it's worthy of bringing into the discussion and the learning with, with young people and for ourselves as educators is, is whether in using the term fake news, we are, are boosting the argument of those who, who will use this term fake news to, to promote censorship or to say, well, I don't have to listen to you because it's just fake news. Um, I don't have to respond because it's fake news. Um, so by, by us saying um, that, you know, uh, I guess by us propagating this term fake news, are we in some way um, giving, giving energy and oxygen to, to those that use the term fake news to shut everyone down. And so I wonder if we shouldn't be rather saying, how do we counter disinformation? Whether it comes in whatever form it comes in, um, whether it comes in propaganda, whether it comes in, in fake news stories or, or false news stories, it's disinformation we're countering, not necessarily just fake news. Um, because I think the, uh, someone like a, it's not just Donald Trump, but who will use people in my country will use will use fake news to shut down. Um, I think it's it it takes our attention away from actually what's at the root of this is disinformation, the the deliberate creation of something that is there to to that is false, it's fabricated, um, and and in order to counter that, we need to do our work. We need to do our homework and our and our uh, source analysis. As we'll, as we'll come to. So that's just something to think about. Um, and I, and I, I, I don't leave you because I'm not finishing, but I leave you on this point with, with whether, we, whether it's, it's, it's disinformation we should be speaking more about as opposed to this uh, term fake news. And I think especially in, in classrooms. So whether it's fake news or whether it's disinformation, and I, I'm, I suppose, partial to the, the fight against disinformation. Um, as I started at the beginning is that teachers, I think, have the space and this ability, and I would say responsibility, to, to fight back and to push back. Uh, once, once young people leave the history class, maybe they, once they leave the language class, maybe once they leave the citizenship class, and they go to all the other classes, there's not much space for them to be engaging with disinformation. Once they leave school, they're not contained in a space where we can really get them to grapple with this. So in some ways, yeah, I do think we have a responsibility to say, we've got you in our classrooms. We're going to make sure that, that one of the things you walk out with is the ability to, to spot the disinformation, the ability to counter it, the ability to not share it, all of these things. And so, yeah, teachers have a responsibility, and I think history teachers even more so. Um, and I think there is a power of a history teacher. I think we, we inherently, as good history teachers, we have the tools already in our toolbox that can counter disinformation. Because when we go back to historical sources, and I just, I just pulled this out of, 
um, I believe this is from history dot, uh, dot UK. I mean, it, it's pretty generic on, on what a, on what a history teacher will ask students to do. I'm going to just pick on a few things. But one thing, of course, we say to students when we're looking at historical sources, identify the source. Who wrote it? When was it written? What kind of document is it? Um, even, even, you know, that's an important way of engaging with the history of just by starting with just those basic, what do we see on the surface here? And then we ask students to put, put that source into some kind of historical context. Uh, when this source was written, what else was happening? Uh, or written or, or photographed or drawn. It doesn't have to be written, but we'll use written. When it was written, what else was happening? Um, what was happening geographically where that particular place was written? Who, who was the intended audience for what was written? So there's a, a contextualization of the source we're asking. And of course, I mean, what history teacher doesn't ask their students to then consider the author and their purpose? Like, why are they, who, like, who was this author? What did they bring with them in their gender, their religion, their uh, nationality, their political parties, job? What biases would they, do they bring um, uh, in their language, in what they're saying? Are they trying to incite? Are they trying to enlighten, explain, deceive? These are questions we are asking them to consider when we put an historical source in front of them. And then we ask them to evaluate that information. So we don't just say to them, here's a historical source, now repeat the source to me and you get 10 marks for your essay. No, of course, we're asking them to, for sure, summarize the key points. Um, we're asking them to look for bias, for look for intention. We're saying to them, are there footnotes? Do they refer to other historical um, uh, moments or people? Um, uh, what is the overall theme? We, we ask them, I, I, I italicize these pieces. Well, how does the author claim to have their information? What assumptions does the author make? Is the author expecting some kind of result or action or opinion from the audience of the source? So these are, these are our kind of historical tools that we, we teach young people from a young age in history classes to evaluate historical sources. And of course, why could those not be, and why should they not be the same, same tools we give to modern sources, something that comes on, on a young person's um, Facebook feed, although young people don't use Facebook, not yet. Maybe they will when Mark Zuckerberg's meta comes in, who knows? Good luck, Mark. Um, but, but on their WhatsApp feeds or their Instagram feeds, um, like why don't we ask them to say, well, let's take some uh, 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 a piece of news content in whatever way you're getting it in, in, let's say, media content. Think about who created this. Uh, when did they create this? Was this created last week? Was this created last night? Can you tell? Um, uh, can we put this in context that, at all? Of course, one question we can ask is who, who's the, who do you think the intended audience of this is for? Um, do we know anything about the author? Uh, if we do know anything about the author, can they tell us about their possible message or their possible intention? Are they in their language, in their imagery? Are they trying to persuade, enlighten us? All the same questions we're asking of the historical sources, we can be asking similar ones. We can ask other ones too, but similar ones of, um, of I guess, new media sources. Um, but we are, of course, we want them to evaluate the information. How similar is this information that you're getting to other information that exists already. And we'll look at a tool to, to get that. Um, what is the author claiming to have information about? What assumptions is the author making about? So these same questions, and, and all of you as history teachers across the world um, and across Europe, you all have different ways of teaching source analysis. Some of those things are the kinds of things we're going to be telling kids is it's not just historical sources to be able to write your essay and get a great mark. Those are the same tools that are going to help you to engage with the information that you are being flooded with um, at the moment. And so history teachers, more than other teachers, and probably citizenship teachers where this comes in as well, but definitely history teachers, we already do this work. What we need to do is when we are teaching historical sources and we're teaching in a historical period of time, maybe it's the French Revolution, what stops us from once they've been engaging with some primary sources and they've looked at bias and uh, opinion and these ideas, what stops us from then putting a modern day source next to them and saying, let's take exactly the same tools that you did to interact with that French Revolution source and let's 
let's look at this at this new piece of news that has just come out now. Um, because that, of course, it links young people from the present to the from the past to the present, but it's also saying to them, and I would say constantly reinforcing, which means we should be constantly doing this, it's reinforcing this idea that that we are constantly have to evaluate the information that we get, not just in old fuddy daddy historical sources. So um, a couple of, um, of, of I, I want to leave you with a couple of kind of tools, very simple things that, that you can, um, that, that, we, that can either be underpinning our work, both historically in sources, but also in countering the disinformation, whether it's propaganda or fake news. Um, and there are just, uh, I guess, three things really. One is this is the, are these, I guess, these questions we should always be asking. Um, is how do these facts fit into my worldview versus this idea of how do these facts confirm what I already believe? Most of us look for facts to confirm what we already believe. And so we know there's confirmation bias. We know we are hardwired to say, I have a belief. I look around the world to find information that supports that belief. And so if we are looking at news articles or commentators that only confirm our belief, even if that belief is a nice belief to have, we, what we are doing is feeding our confirmation bias. Sometimes we also have to let go a little and say, here's a piece of article. It may not confirm what I already believe, and it may not fit into my worldview, but that's a reason for me to engage with it. Because the more we engage with things that don't always fit into our worldview, the more we can start to also break down some of the confirmation bias. So I think there's, there is this... this you know, if we're able to, to, to put some text in front of your young people and say, say, like, you know, look at what this says. Does it fit what you understand about the world? Um, or does it confirm what you already believe? Because if it confirms, then let's look for some other stuff that, that maybe counteracts that. Of course, we're not saying to children and ourselves, because we should be doing this as well, not just young people. Uh, we're not just saying that you can't believe what you believe, but we are trying to say, hold your belief, suspend your belief, for a moment, just for a small moment to look at another point of view. Because it's not to say that your view, your belief it will not be valid and won't be held. It's just to give an opportunity to say, maybe there's another way to look at this. Maybe there's another small crack where a different light will, will shine through. Another option is another great way, and this I've, this I've seen, um, and, and let me just say, I should have said this at the beginning, that, that we should never be bringing these tools into classrooms. And again, I'm, I'm speaking to the converted because you're history teachers who are coming to professional development, so you're already on this page. But, but we should never be bringing these tools to say these are just the tools for young people to use. No, of course, we've got to be using these tools first. We've got to be using these tools as they use the tools. Um, and in fact, I don't know how old you all are, um, but if you're like me and you're 28, no, I'm kidding, I wish. Uh, if you're like me and you're 48, um, technology is changing at a rapid pace and it's very hard to, to kind of keep up. And so, so some of this really does fall on us as adults to really be trying to be one step ahead of the curve. And if not one step ahead of the curve, at least three steps behind, unlike me who's maybe 400 steps behind. But one piece which I would argue, that what I would, I would invite that you do, but also the kids in your class do, is having opportunities to to play with both these ways of reading, vertical reading and lateral reading. So vertical reading, if you're on a, on a computer, and of course we're not all doing our reading on computers, um, but many of us are reading on our phones, is to go onto a website and, and vertically read the information that you get. And that could be a, a news article, you're just reading it down, and then that's the information you get. What did, you can ask them questions, what did you learn from this, uh, what opinions are there, that's it, great. Then you ask them to do lateral reading. Same topic, but instead of reading down on their browser, they're reading across. So now they're having to open tabs of maybe different news sources, different ideas, different sources of information all around the topic. Um, for them to then eventually do lateral reading to eventually see whether there's other information they haven't thought about, other points of view they haven't engaged with. Again, not to say that their views can never should should um, must always change. They can hold on to their views, but allowing some lateral reading and open up browsers on your website 
uh, laterally, again, this is if you're on a, not on a phone, um, which allows for diff the possibility of different points of views uh, to come in. And then I think the last thing, and this is, this is not necessarily only my words, but I think it's summed up uh, perfectly beautiful, is it, it, some of it's kind of logical. It's like one of, one of the mantras uh, that we should be promoting in our, in our, well, in all classes, not just history classes, is in whatever topic it is that we're dealing with, we have to read widely. Reading widely is not one article. Reading li widely is not one favorite news source or one favorite website or one favorite news feed. Reading widely is, is not just an amount of reading, but it's a wide distribution of reading, diverse reading, um, to really immerse yourself into a topic. Um, we have to be comfortable with ambiguity. And we have to allow kids to be comfortable with ambiguity. We may not have all the answers. We may, we may as we open up lots of browsers and we look at lots of different um, news broadcasts on a particular issue and lots of different viewpoints, it may leave us confused. That's okay. We, we need to sometimes feel that it's okay to, to not have a clear black and white answer to these, to these issues because, because we know around events and news and sources, there are multiple views. There are different um, uh, deliberate distortions and there are misrepresentations. So we have to be, be breaking this idea of, I'm comfortable when I know the truth. I'm comfortable when I know it all. Um, but, but not that we're not obviously saying that you also need to just, you know, give up because you'll never find a truth or there is no truth or there are no facts. Um, of course they are, but that, that sitting in that ambiguity of discomfort is, I think, an important thing. And then I think, and especially this is a, this is in the, you know, so crucial to, to the social media world we live in is that if we have, if we've just read one article and we immediately share it, then we started to be a part of the problem. Even if that article turns out to be a great, truthful, good article. We really have to look at something and ask a few questions about that article. Where did I get this? Who sent this to me? Why did they send this to me? What do I know about the person who sent this article to me? Um, let me read one more article just to see whether this actually is um, more likely to be more truth. Um, but really, I, I like the definitiveness of if you haven't engaged with a critical eye, don't share it. Because the moment you share anything without a critical eye, you are being um, responsible, I suppose. So to take us back to where we, uh, where we began, um, if we think about it, um, in 1937, this very short-lived Institute for Propaganda Analysis, what they, what they did is they looked around and said, you know, if we can help people name the, to name the, the, the tools that these propagandists use, if we can help them identify these tools, then they're going to be more armed to engage with the world, engage with the media, and engage with the information they get. Um, and so that was 1937, and it, yeah, they didn't last long, and propaganda took over the world soon, soon afterwards. But they were, they were onto something about if we can, if we can break down what, the, what propaganda is doing to us, we're more likely to, um, to be able to resist it. As it turns out, in um, this just a year or two ago, um, uh, they're not the only people, but Sander van Linden and uh, John Rusenbeek, um, both uh, involved in social psychology and psychology, um, they did um, some research around what is called inoculation theory. And really what they were trying to test, and of course, you know, their research is not definitive yet, but it seems to be onto something. What they try to test is that is that if you preemptively warn people of an, an impending attack on their beliefs, so some information is going to come and then it's going to, you know, be counter to what you believe, um, and, that, and that you're preempting the persuasive argument before they encounter this misinformation, what's likely to happen is that the, the fake news is less, success, uh, less, suscept less susceptible or people are less susceptible to the fake news. So they're saying if we're able to warn people of, of what, what is coming, uh, what the tools are, going back to the 1937 organization, before they encounter it, their research said, or, or their conclusion in their research was that 
we're able to inoculate people against the manipulation techniques commonly used by fake news producers. So the forewarning, i.e., what kinds of things do they do? What kind of things should I be looking for? What kind of language? What kind of headlines? Um, who sends it to me? All of these things, if we're forewarned by it, then we're going to be less susceptible to it. And so that's what their studies show, that forewarning created less susceptibility. And so, again, it goes back to our space and our power as history teachers, is we have the space to forewarn young people. We have the space to say, let's spend some time really breaking down how this, how this machine of propaganda, how this machine of disinformation for various purposes works. Because if we break it down, you can, young people can identify it. They're forewarned. They're looking for it. And they can become a little bit more less susceptible to these very, very powerful forces of, of disinformation. So let me end there. I, I want to just say that, that, go back to my point about the responsibility that we have and the opportunity, but more the responsibility, especially as history teachers, to be the ones in our school um, or the ones in our universities who are really holding that kind of, what is it? The safety net for young people to say, it's our job to make sure you're not susceptible to this because our world shows us that this disinformation can damage. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Dylan, so, so much for hosting this great keynote lecture.